Welcome to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. My name is Richard Lawrence, and we have with us our esteemed panel, Anna Jane Peril, Dan Sanchez, Mary Ann March, and our special guest, John Miltimore, our managing editor at Fee.org. Welcome to the FeeCast. We're very, very happy to have you here this week. Thanks, Richard. Happy to be here. Yeah, so... We are, uh, if it hasn't already, in the midst of a hurricane hitting the United States on the eastern seaboard. Hurricane Florence, of course, Mm -hmm. has been the talk of the news this week, and in some cases seems to be maybe a little bit overdone in terms of how often we're hearing about it and sort of the updates regularly of, of the strength decreasing and increasing again. And, you know, by the time we're recording this right now, we actually don't know how bad this hurricane will have been by Friday mm. when we release the podcast, but we're expecting it to be fairly severe. Yeah, and already it, already we've had four states um, declare a state of emergency, both the Carolinas, Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. And it might eventually hit Georgia. Uh, it's going to make like a left turn um, but then by then it'll have died down. It won't be a hurricane anymore, the predictions. The president is actually giving on the hour updates, I think, on this. On right Twitter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> on Twitter, of course, on Twitter, right? Yeah. Yes. The great state of Georgia, he warned, is going to be affected. And so yeah. as we're talking about this, obviously we're not aware of the full extent of the damage. We're mm-hmm. aware at this point at least a million people have been ordered to evacuate yes. from their homes in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. And so, of course, our thoughts are with everyone who is being affected by the hurricane. Today we want to talk talk a little bit about a couple facets of what we've been able to observe thus far. And one of them, in fact, is sort of the news side of everything. Of course, uh, it is the news of the week. And it almost appears as if the media is sometimes maybe cheering it along in terms of gathering strength and and uh, encouraging it to be a big story. I, I noticed this morning uh, I was having breakfast at the at the Artmore, the wonderful Artmore. And over my exit, there was a news you know cast on and they're talking about how the, the storm might turn. Um, and, and the anchor is like, but it's still going to be really, really bad. Right. Like it's still going to. And he's like, well, the problem is it could actually weaken. And he oh, says that the, problem. Pro- the problem yeah. is it could weaken. And I think it's a slip of the tongue. I don't think they want anybody, you know, they don't have any ill will. Um, but it shows that we do sensationalize these things a little bit. Um, we get wrapped up in them. And sometimes um, we can maybe even I- exaggerate the, the effects of them. And you, John, speak with authority on this as a member of the media before joining FEE. Uh, so this is not something alien that you're just sort of opining on. It's funny. I, I noticed once, like, I'm like, gosh, like the media really does love these weather stories. And there was a couple of times during bad storms, they're like, hey, just go get a camera and, and, and go over here. There's going to be flooding. And I'm like, all right. Like, so we drive to some of like the, the, these places that are built in very low levels. And sure mm-hmm. enough, there's people like they're paddling to get around from place to place. Um, and it is like I got to say, like the, the coverage was kind of interesting. I'm like, I had no idea that people are, are still building here. And, and it happens mm-hmm. pretty frequently. And, and they, they must like it. They're, they're staying. But there is that propensity to, for, for media to they love weather stories for, for whatever reason. And they love negative that news too. in yeah. general because it makes people afraid and, well, and it seems people If are it bleeds, biased. it leads. Right. Well, yeah, yeah, when we say media loves things, it really just means the people that watch media love these things, it's right? True. We have, yeah. I mean, I was just talking to um, to somebody who, a friend of mine who's from Florida and she was talking about it with an ex- with an excited tone. She was like, oh my gosh, yeah. She's like, I'm sorry, I'm from Florida. We love storms. And just kind of like, it, it's fun. It's, it's, you know, and it's kind of crazy to think about something so um, scary and intense to be kind of entertaining. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, because for many people in the United States, they don't get to experience this sort of weather. It's usually mm-hmm. people in the Gulf, people on the eastern seaboard. Of course, this is being called the storm of a lifetime right now. So on the eastern seaboard, at least, it's being uh, called probably the strongest storm in decades, right? But I think a lot of us on the panel actually have our own experiences with hurricanes. Mine, as a matter of fact, was last year when I got married outside of New Orleans. A couple of you were there, and Hurricane Nate was supposed to hit. Mm -hmm. uh, And in fact, at the very last second, ended off and and veered off eastward and ended up making landfall probably as a tropical storm in Mobile, Alabama. And so we got the western side of the storm. And basically the best of that was the beautiful sunset the Mm -hmm. night of the wedding. The ground was soaked. Some people's shoes were soaked during the day. We didn't actually have it uh, or outside. We ended up doing it sort of in an inside area. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of a last second 
sort of addition to the festivities, which I guess yeah. made it a little bit different. Yeah, well, yeah. we were fortunate. I mean, hurricanes, there's, you know, people maybe have a little perverse excitement about them, like I do about the movie Twister, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, there's, a classic of the 90s. I think that there's something about storms. It's kind of like how people feel about horror films, where... Mm-hmm. We enjoy confronting our mortality in a weird kind of way. But on a more serious note, when we look back at past hurricanes, like when Hurricane Katrina swept through Louisiana in 2005, there was a lot of damage and a lot of deaths. Um, Over 1,500 fatalities, over a million people displaced, and $125 billion worth of damage. It's not all... Tender hooks on the news. There's real lives being impacted. It's lives and destruction mm. of lives. Even Hurricane Harvey, which I think they I remember they said that one technically stalled. There were still 88 people killed in that. There was tens mm. of thousands displaced, and that was one that wasn't. We don't think of as being as destructive. Mm-hmm. You just see those images last year of Houston underwater. It was incredible. It was absolutely mm-hmm. incredible. People in boats driving past roofs. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Was that just last year? It seems longer ago than that. Wow. And so uh, we live through these storms. We end up observing the effect of these storms. Um, But some people end up saying, and we might take issue with this, that there is silver lining to these sorts of storms. And I wonder, Dan, if you might offer a little bit on that, because I think we we talk about that quite a bit at FEE in terms of the economic sense. Yeah, I wrote an article back when two hurricane seasons ago when there was Hurricane Matthew hitting uh, the coast. And... um, I was just noticing that a lot of news reports were claiming, well, you know, our condolences to the people who are suffering from this, but at least we can actually see some economic benefit from these storms. And and basically their argument is that there's going to be a lot of destruction, but destruction means rebuilding. Hmm. And rebuilding means economic activity. And just think of all the, the rebuilding businesses and, and how great business will be f- for them, h- how great their profits will be. Um, think about all of their uh, suppliers that, that they will be boosted. And think, think about like the, the new buildings and, and uh, the economic activity that can be like if it's a new concert hall and, and the economic activity out of that. And really, it just reminded me of a classic that, that we talk about, uh, talk about a lot, the, the, the broken window parable. And uh, Frederick Bastiat, a, a great economist from the 19th century, he was the one who originated it. Uh, someone who was very close to Fee, Henry Hazlitt, he updated it for the modern audience. And it really showed the uh, economic error in that line of thinking. And so your article that you mentioned on Hurricane Matthew uh, from a couple of years ago is entitled Hurricanes Have No Silver Lining. And we actually have a link to it in the description right below the video. And tell us a little bit more about this broken window parable, because I think people may have sometimes heard of it, but might not know entirely what it means. Sure. So Bastiat posits, say a a boy picks up a rock and throws it through the window of a bakery. And people gather around and the baker comes out and he sees his broken window and he's bummed. But everyone consoles him and says, you know, this is good for the econ- local economy. When Vandalism you think about it. is positive for the economy. All right, keep going. <laughs> because in order to repair this window, you're going to have to pay the glazier to, to, to fix it. And that, of course, is the person who the is going to make the window. The window <laughs> yeah. guy is the, the glazier, window right? window dude. Yeah. yeah. So, so say you pay him $100, $100, and then he's able to use that $100 to uh, you know, pay some, somebody for something else. And then they can pay somebody for something else. And it just kind of filters through the economy. And ultimately, that little boy did a, everyone a, a service by stimulating <laughs> the economy. And, uh, you got to love a good economic stimulus. Right? Yeah, so yeah. why don't we all throw rocks? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, why, why don't we just stimulate the heck out of the whole town just by destroying everything? <laughs> it's like a fundamental uh, uh, breakdown there between like the idea of, of wealth versus production, right? Like they're, they're, they're two very different things. And I think we often overlook that. I think we're, we're much better at measuring one than the other too. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so Bastiat really emphasized that 
good ec ec economists don't just look at the seen, they look at the unseen. They look at the things that didn't happen. Um, and so, for example, imagine if the window wasn't broken and if the, uh -huh. the baker had that money to use for a new suit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so instead of the money going to the glazier, yeah. the, the money would go to the tailor instead. And so that he would benefit instead. And he's, he's the unseen in this situation. And then the, uh, the um, baker would then have a new suit and his, his window. intact window at the same time. And so really, you're still losing. That if you just focus on a benefit to one particular party, then that you're missing the, the whole picture. Uh, and then if you think not just in terms of consumption goods like the suit, but production goods. What if the baker had invested in a new oven? Then uh, the, by not having a new oven that more efficiently produces more baked goods, then all these potential consumers of these new baked goods, then they lose out from, from this act of destruction. Because the price would go down because it's more efficient for him to produce the same good, right? Is that what you're saying? Well, so well, like as a customer, you then, oh, you know, a piece of, or a loaf of bread becomes cheaper. So therefore, if he does not, because he now has to pay for the window, which you can invest in, let's say, an oven that now makes bread cheaper or more efficiently, yeah. making bread, the price of bread lower, customers right. lose out, ultimately. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right, so the purpose for which the baker is actually there to make bread for people mm -hmm. is disrupted by right. this activity that destroyed rather than produced. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So along the same lines, when you look at a, a hurricane disaster area, like sure, um, it's good for the rebuilding businesses uh, for, for their bottom line, but what about all of the economic activity that could have been funded if that money had been directed to something else, to, to, uh, to, to more food or, or to n new uh, buildings or, or new economic activity? You, you have to look at the whole picture. It goes back to sort of that superficial sort of uh, excitement that the media will sometimes indulge mm -hmm. in that says, because we've seen uh, this one thing happen, uh, everything that happens after that is due to the hurricane or to the storm or to the vandal who threw mm -hmm. the rock in there. If you don't have an event that creates a need for something, it's it's not even worth reporting on, right? Right. Yeah. If if the if the economy on the coast were just proceeding as as usual, producing mm -hmm. bread and and glass and windows and all the normal things needed for commerce and everyday life, it would be just sort of a everyday the story activity. There? There's yeah. no story, yeah. and yet we end up confusing destruction for creation. Mm -hmm. And you see this a lot in news reports or op-eds right after events like Hurricane Florence happen. Oh, well, you know, there was all this destruction of the local economy, but at least the general contractors have something to do now and people will be employed in construction, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. But it's such a funny way that our heads are programmed to work. Right, mm -hmm. right. Instead of rebuilding all these buildings that we already had before, um, there, there could have been like entirely new businesses, like high-tech, more, more modern businesses, as opposed to just replacing what you already had. Mm -hmm. But I think in some senses, when we talk about civil society, not just the economic side of things, but people helping people, there can sometimes be a silver lining to witnessing how people help each other after mm -hmm. storms, right? I mean, when you look at p places like New York after what they called Superstorm Sandy, right? So that it wasn't just a hurricane, it was Superstorm. Mm -hmm. So they ended up, you know, in inventing sort of a new term to describe that. But you look in New York, and of course, power's out for maybe a week or two. And I was just looking before we had the show, there was an image of a bunch of uh, surge protectors and power strips and extension cords outside of someone's house that they were putting onto the street so that people could plug in their phone charge chargers mm -hmm. and end up, you know, giving each other power. That's the least of the examples of how communities come together and these sorts of mm -hmm. things. But it's still one of those things to observe uh, as we're dealing with the fallout from these disasters. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Uh, I read a New York Times article several years ago. Um, it, the, the writer Walker Percy, who's not well known, um, not that well known anyway. He was he was from New Orleans. Um, he uh, he's probably best known, I think, for getting uh, the book uh, "A Confederacy of Dunces" published. Uh, That's one of my favorite yeah. books. I love that book. Um, after the the death of who, who's the author? I think it was John Kennedy uh, Tool. I think John Maynard. Oh, John yeah. Maynard Keynes. I'm sorry. I, I don't know, just Kennedy one Toole. of those three people names. Yeah, John, <laughs> and, and, and so so Percy got that published, but uh, you know he was a he was a great author, uh, Catholic author, and he the, the theme of hurricanes 
popped up in a lot of his literature. Um, and he saw them as a very, you know, redemptive force. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you look in his writing, it shows that like barriers between people just kind of fall away during these storms. We lean on each other. Um, we look after each other. Um, and I think the theme for him is it, it, it offers meaning, you know, for mm-hmm. us that sometimes we, in our, in our postmodern world, we don't have, we don't feel. Um, and it reminds us that, you know, this matters. This is all very real and, and it could end. And, uh, and there's something human about that, right? And, and, and that's why I, when you look at things of, like danger, that's why we go to haunted houses or mm-hmm. amusement parks. And that's why we do get excited about storms. Because that, that, that danger, there is something that attracts us to that because it does remind us, I think, of, of meaning to, to some extent. Makes us feel alive. Yeah. It reminds me a little yeah. bit of the Twilight Zone episode I was watching last night. I forget the great. title of it. But this guy ends up making a deal with the devil to live forever. He's a hypochondriac to begin with. And then he gets the devil uh, to give him immortal, Im- immortality, right? And then he ends up doing all these things to, you know, give himself thrills because he's no longer afraid of, of dying. Is and that he, the one with uh, Burgess Meredith, the Rocky trainer? Who Does he play the devil? I don't believe okay, so. They're, they're, it looks one. a this little might, bit like it. This sounds him, like a little bit different. Okay. But anyway, um, he ends up trying to get run over by a train, trying to jump off a building to you know feel the uh, life again, hmm. and ends up in the end, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't <laughs> seen this after about 60 years, ends up uh, calling in the uh, escape clause from the contract he's had with the devil so that he, he has a heart attack. But anyway, we do. We, we, we get excited by these sorts of things, and hopefully we also become excited by helping each other out. And in fact, uh, going back to sort of the economic side of things, uh, after Hurricane uh, Katrina, obviously there was a huge response from the federal agency FEMA, which is now working to address the uh, fallout from from Florence. And uh, there was a point at which FEMA, which is charged with helping uh, people Mm -hmm. in storms, was actually preventing people from helping other people. Why yeah. would they do that? R- Robert Murphy wrote about it uh, back then uh, for Fee, and he wrote, FEMA officials rejected trucks of supplies from Walmart, prevented the Red Cross from delivering food, turned back a 500-boat citizen flotilla that wished to help with evacuation, turned down offers of generators, refused the Coast Guard's efforts to deliver diesel fuel, and incredibly actually sent out an alert to first responders nationwide telling them not to respond to the disaster. Wow. This is unbelievable. Well, what hurricane was this again? Katrina. Katrina. It was Katrina. Oh, Wait, why? Until specifically requested through the appropriate channels. Like, it has to be through us. Basically. Oh, it was because it was a process. It was a process issue and not, we don't need that. It was, no, it needs to go through the proper, like, the proper channel to get to us. Like, right. the, the help. And that we as FEMA are the only channel. And it's probable that mm. they were thinking something about traffic, not wanting to put other people in danger. These Walmart trucks are just sort of lined up at the border to New Orleans or Louisiana, Mm -hmm. whichever, and they're saying, no, we don't want to let anybody in. Um, But it doesn't seem like that's a proportional response, especially when these trucks are carrying supplies that can help the lives of many people there. Yeah, I, I think it just shows the, the error of central planning, the, the notion that this big federal agency knows better than people on the ground um, w- what is actually needed. Uh, the, the, and then because so many times, especially when you're so wedded to just procedure and, and just telling everybody, wait, wait until I have every, everyone freeze until I have everything figured out. And you can't figure it th- everything out. So, you, so people just keep being frozen and not mm-hmm. able to help each other. This leads right into the price gouging issue, right? Like when you say, well, oh, you, you can't everyone charge that for that. You can't gouging. charge that. Mm-hmm. That's predatory pricing. Um, and we've seen how that plays out. Um, and you mean price gouging in, in the wake of a disaster of some exactly. kind, like how we handle goods and like, I mean, very yeah. limited goods like exactly. water and things like that. I am pro price gouging. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, because Murphy uh, mentioned that another response was President Bush himself um, made stern warnings against price gouging. So, mm-hmm. so, and, and that's sort of the, uh, the common feeling is that, oh, it's just inhumane to raise prices when people are at their most vulnerable, to actually take advantage of that situation and spike prices on what you're selling. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, it may be well-intentioned, but it actually hurts people when you prevent people from charging Mm -hmm. uh, whatever the market will bear. So let's talk about price gouging, because of course this is 
probably one of those more difficult conversations to have with people yeah. um, when we're speaking from the economic standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. And so like you were saying, Dan, the notion behind the concern and even the term price gouging mm -hmm. is that in a moment of crisis or a moment of shortage, um, that companies, sellers, will actually hike the price and thereby prevent people who actually need those goods and services from acquiring them, mm -hmm. right? And so this can be done with all sorts of things, right? You see it in the news all the time. You've got Delta committing now not to have higher price than two ninety nine for one way out of storm areas, right? And so mm -hmm. they, as a company, have succumbed to the pressure that we can't, that, that they shouldn't raise their prices um, in order to basically ration goods. And so you get this all the time, things with uh, gasoline. You get it with mm -hmm. airplane tickets. You get it with uh, various other... Generators. Uh, generators. Water. Water, yeah. 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 Water is when I mm -hmm. saw where people were just scarfing up water, um, yeah. tons of it, and you had people that weren't getting any. Right. Well, it's incredibly difficult to prevent people from stockpiling. And so when you say that we can't raise prices above a certain level, then the people who get there first are going to see that. They're going mm -hmm. to stockpile. Maybe they'll price gouge themselves uh, in the black market. Right, because when you have a limited uh, supply of a good, it's going to be distributed according to some rule. And if it's not going to be price according to pricing, it's going to be according to something else, like mm -hmm. might makes right, like whoever's whoever's tougher. The pushiest to get mm -hmm. to the front or, of the line. Yeah. Or, yeah, for who first come, first serve. Mm -hmm. But then when prices are artificially low, that motivates people to, to just stockpile, like you said, mm -hmm. to just even, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. if... Even if they don't need those items. Yeah, yeah as much. Yeah. And so the people who maybe desperately need it but came later... Um, that that they are they they won't have any. Whereas if there was a, a, a price mechanism, then then that's when urgency matters. When when the mm -hmm. person who comes there first says like, well, um, you know, I guess I I might like to to get extra water just in case, or or maybe I'm I'm like extra thirsty, but it's pretty expensive, so I'm gonna mm -hmm. hold off. Yeah. And meanwhile, someone who really urgently needs it, and they're gonna say, okay, I'm I'm willing to pay for this. As an example, we have a, a great speaker that comes to a lot of our programs um, for high schoolers specifically, Michael Clark. He's actually on the Fee Audio Experience. You can find mm -hmm. him there. Um, he actually has a talk exactly about this situation where there was some emergency. Him and his wife were in. They were in the in the store and they were going to buy a flashlight and she's like oh they'll probably be like five bucks whatever they find them it says five bucks they get to the counter they're 20 bucks and she had, she had scooped up a couple and she's like oh we one only need do. one never yeah. mind yeah. let me yeah. put these back right. um and and thinking about how that does inform your decisions it changes okay we need these and then thinking about if they had taken home six versus one that mm -hmm. maybe six other families couldn't couldn't see yeah. we all right. do it right i do it at the grocery store whenever i see limes get slashed to like a quarter or 30 cents <laughs> i'm like woo and i i, I grab You're a big ten lime guy yeah like, I love yeah. limes. I'm more of a lemon gal. They're, they're, they're normally a buck a piece. So I see yeah. them you know, down to 30 cents. I, I don't get two. I, I get eight of them. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. store is happy with that. I'm happy with that. Mm -hmm. well, let's, so let's talk through it real quick because let's use the real world example of Delta announcing the other day out of the storm affected areas, places like Charleston, mm -hmm. that they're only going to charge $299. $200, $299 in order to mm -hmm. get out of those areas. They're capping the price of an airline ticket. What will that do? It will disincentivize uh, making more flights available mm -hmm. for that route. Right. Uh, because uh, because other, there, there isn't as much of a profit opportunity. Um, because people, people think that it's only a distribution problem, but it's also a production problem. And uh, we have this article by Steve Horwitz where he characterizes it, uh, price, high prices as a signal flare. Right. It's, it's a signal flare saying that, okay, <clears throat> stuff is really scarce right here, right mm -hmm. now, and there's big demand for it. So, so the high price is a signal flare that says, okay, there's a profit opportunity here. There's a humanitarian need too, but there's also a profit opportunity that will make airlines and water bottle providers respond to that mm -hmm. profit opportunity with more supply. And then as more supply comes online, then the price goes back down. That's the way prices function in general, even it end in an extreme situation. But if we're thinking yeah. about a real world application here, I mean, we want, I mean, if you're a business and law and longevity, 
in profit is important to you, this move might also look good for Delta. It's like, I mean, and yes, it may not, it may not incentivize them to make any more routes available than they would normally. It's better optics but than the profit them, they might not hit, yes. you know, for this. But, yeah. but, but Dan's point is that's not helping people. No, right? you know? no, it's not. It's it, it absolutely. Yeah, people no, will not. ultimately get out yeah. because of that. Most likely. Yeah. yeah. And especially with things like water and resources, maybe I as an entrepreneur can't just throw together an airline, but I could load up my car with bottles of water and head for North Carolina. There's, people who could do that all over the country, depending on their opportunity costs. And when you have limits in place for prices, they have no incentive to get in their cars and go. Well, well actually, the, oh, sorry. Well, I was I just going to say that like the optics doesn't matter as much for small businesses because they're yeah. not, they're not big brands. And so you also want to, inc- right. Mm-hmm. right. So you also want to incentivize them to, to really hustle, to get these uh, mm-hmm. s- supplies out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I want to, I want to dig in really quick Dan, mm-hmm. to something you mentioned sort of offhand. And I think it's important because many people will admit that prices have a role in non-emergency times, right? Mm-hmm. The price system works until there's a storm or until there's an earthquake. And those same people will, will then say, but when there is that storm, when there's that moment of crisis and people are on, uh, in terms of life and death, right, then prices don't matter anymore. They don't work anymore. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, why would people think prices stop working when a storm happens? Well, I think it's because something that happens in a subtle way on an everyday basis um, in an emergency the same thing is happening on a really magnified level where, where you're really seeing, you know, you, you see the supreme scarcity and then you see like the, the big price hike and... Um, and everyone's watching on national media. Right, right. So I, so I think it's just like the spectacle of the thing and it's something that they don't understand, but, but that is all of a sudden more evident and more vi- visible. And so they just want to crush something that they don't understand. Um, I think that's probably. And so the, the laws of economics don't get thrown out the window when we have a big storm. Right, right. That's the, um, the title of the Horwitz piece that I mentioned is that hurricanes don't blow away economic law um, and that prices have a function and they don't stop having a function uh, when, when hurricanes happen. And in fact, they have even more of a function because that's mm-hmm. when it's even more urgent for prices to do the job of getting goods to the people who need them most. You know, you remind me, Dan, there's a video put out by our friends at the Institute for Humane Studies. They have a series of videos called Learn Liberty, and one of them is an animation from a few years back, and it's all about this notion of price gouging. And in that video, they actually look at an example of uh, an electrical generator and how if you were just to have a cap on the price of an electrical generator, it might not go to the person who needs it most, right? An electrical generator is maybe something a little bit uh, less necessary than water. But think, for example, if the price of an electrical generator is capped at 100 bucks, where uh, in, in the usual uh, economic way, it might actually go higher than $100. There are a lot of people who are looking for electricity during a storm. Some of them need it more than others, mm-hmm. right? And so the example of the uh, electrical generator story is that you have, for example, a person who might just want to go in and, and power his TV and his Xbox so he can play games, right? All right, mm-hmm. that's a legitimate reason to buy an electrical generator. But there's also the person who gets to the store after the person who ended up wanting to buy it for uh, electrical, uh, to have games, um, a person who needs to plug it into their refrigerator so that they mm-hmm. can actually preserve not only food, but insulin, a mm-hmm. life-saving substance for that person. And because the cap was in place for that generator, that person who truly needs it more and mm-hmm. would have been willing to pay much more than $100 mm-hmm. Maybe not like the person who needed it just for games, but that person no longer has access to that finite good that is scarce in that situation. And that example has always stuck with me because only you know the severity that you need to Mm -hmm. get something, right? Only you know the seriousness of whether you need water or electrical generator or gasoline. And if you're willing to pay, you should be able to have the chance to pay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and mm-hmm. these economic principles hold up post hurricane too, right? And uh, mm-hmm. we, we've we've touched on that a little bit. Um, you know, it, God forbid if you know as we're talking, this rolls in and there is devastation. 
how they choose to operate in the rebuilding is going to matter a lot too. If they let market forces operate, mm-hmm. or if they you know put a higher price on labor and more regulations, or we, if they subsidize yeah. rebuilding in hurricane-prone areas, and that that mm-hmm. incentivizes unnecessary risk mm-hmm. because the the burden of the risk is placed on the taxpayer. And, and mm-hmm. I mentioned that story earlier, like when we go out to these places that were. Uh, Living in place, I couldn't believe they're living in these low elevation mm-hmm. places that are getting flooded. I think I'm, I'm I don't remember a hundred percent, but I'm pretty sure that was the issue there. They were getting loan insurance that they that they probably wouldn't have in the market, but they were they were covered uh, by some federal mm-hmm. le- regulation. So they didn't really have a, an incentive to say maybe I shouldn't build here. Yeah. Well, we do have to wrap up. Of course, there's a lot to talk about from an economic sense in all of these storms. Uh, I'm happy that we covered price gouging. Have we covered the fact that storms don't blow uh, the economic laws out of the window? And of course, as all of this happens uh, and we want to take uh, teachable moments, we think about all the people who are affected by these storms mm-hmm. and hope that they're well and uh, that they recover nicely. Um, but until we are able to join you again next week, uh, we're going to take a break and see you next week on the FeeCast. Thank <laughs> you.